You're joining us today for the very first part of a conversation that I was having with Mr. Alan Ferguson from Service Professionals Australia and the Omega Group. The conversation was about sales and it was sparked by, um, I suppose, a few questions that had been brought up within our Facebook community. And I've got Alan on the show to answer these questions, basically due largely to his track record as a tradesman with the Amiga Group. And secondly, as now a training organization uh, with Service Professionals Australia, they spend a lot of time and resource in this space. And some of the questions have been really good. Um, If you want to join those conversations, guys, just head across to Facebook and join the Facebook group. Just type in the site shed and you'll find it. Anyway, if you're interested in that topic, if you're interested in pricing and a lot of the stuff that Alan likes to talk about is around the flat rate model. Obviously, as a he runs a maintenance sort of based uh, company, emergency service uh, company, and they do a lot of their pricing within the flat rate model. Uh, so it's a fantastic tool if it's done correctly, and I encourage you to um, dig a little deeper there. If you would like those sort of topics, there's also episode 19 where we're talking about pricing for profit with Matt from Cube. There was um, episode 65 and 68 with Adrian from Train Group. There was episode 87, 87, 93, 94, and 95. They were all relative to getting paid for bids, and then one, that was an entire series on flat rate pricing. So there's a lot of content there, guys. I'll post links to this anyway in the show notes so you can go back and check them out. Um, in your own time. However, this episode is, I split this in two. It was a conversation that we had over the phone, um, just a casual conversation. We covered off with some really good points. So this is the first part. I'm sure you'll enjoy it. And if you do, go ahead and leave us a review. We'd really appreciate that. Or maybe you can share it with someone else who might enjoy it. Thank you. The SiteShed podcast is made possible because of Trady Web Guys, creators of beautiful websites designed specifically for tradies and contractors. If you're tired of dealing with web designers that have no idea about your industry, then head across to tradywebguys.com.au and reach out. Like many companies from all over the place, you'll be very glad you did. Giving tradies and contractors around the globe the tools to run a modern business. You're listening to Toolbox Talks from the Site Shed. Now here's your host, Matt Jones. Hello, listeners, and welcome back to Toolbox Talks on this Site Shed podcast. My name is Matt Jones, and I'm joined at the mic today by my friend and colleague, Alan Ferguson. Alan, hello. Hey, Matt. Um, yeah, thanks for having me on, buddy. And I have to say that uh, I really enjoyed our time together at uh, Service World Expo in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, probably a good thing that we were there a week before the uh, oh, that horrible shooting, eh? God, no kidding. It was crazy. Yeah, it was a good time. Same hotel. I'll tell you what, though, a week in Vegas, I reckon, will, <laughs> will sort the best of us out. Oh, yeah. I was pretty uh, pretty happy to get back after that trip. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you'd been traveling for uh, weeks ahead uh, yeah. in Canada. and yeah, uh, Canada. But, yeah, I had an incredible time, and I just um, not only spending time with you guys, but all my good buddies, uh, contractor yeah. friends in the U.S. It was amazing. Yeah, it's good to catch up with them all, isn't it? I mean, I speak oh, – yeah. I suppose you and I both speak to them a lot, especially through the podcast and stuff, but um, yeah, it's not often you get to – Get get to meet them face and face, so it was good. Good, uh, it was a good trip for sure. It was fantastic. So, our we um, I've invited you back on the show today as a result of some of the conversations that have been happening within our Facebook group. And for the listeners out there, if you guys are not part of that Facebook group, just head across to Facebook and type in the Site Shed. Um, you'll see the page in the group. You can join the page immediately, and you can request to join the group. Talia will let you in there uh, if she likes you. <laughs> um, however, there's some really good conversations going in there relative to trade, I suppose, business-related topics. And um, obviously, Alan, you've been, you've been in that group for a while now, and you've been able to answer a lot of the good questions in there. So it uh, just made sense to get you on the show to sort of dive a little bit deeper. So thank you for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And I try to uh, I, I try to stay off Facebook as much as possible. But you do a terrible when, job at it. Oh, yeah, it's such a we we have multiple Facebook pages within our business, and I always get sucked into yeah, yeah. what pops up. But I, I will jump in uh, to any post that I see that I feel I have an answer. I mean, I see a lot of stuff there that I look. I have an understanding, but I just don't have mm-hmm. uh, the knowledge, and I feel that I will only comment when I feel I have can add value to uh, to your 
audience. Oh, well, look, that's the idea. And there's lots, there's lots of um, very, very clever people in that group. So if you guys are out there and you want to join the discussion, by all means, go ahead, jump in there. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. You just got to fill in a few questions and then you're in. So for the listeners out there that are not familiar with Alan's story, there was an episode we, we recorded all the way back in March of 2016, which was um, a little bit about Alan's background and businesses that he's built and um, where he is today. We're not going to be so much talking about where you came from today, Alan. We're going to be talking more about some of the specific questions. However, um, I wouldn't mind if you could maybe just give us a quick recap, a bit quick overview of, I suppose, you, your businesses, and um, where you are today with your current company. Sure, quick helicopter view. Yeah. So, 30 years since I started Omega. Omega Plumbing, it started off as, and uh, now we've rebranded to Omega Home Services because we do plumbing, electrical, and uh, air conditioning. And uh, yeah, so, so as you are, Matt, I'm a plumber. Started off from humble beginnings, worked for my dad, started Omega in the garage. But I slugged it out for many years and really struggled to make ends meet. And it was only, it was about 12, 13, maybe 14 years ago, I looked at the a business model involving uh, flat rate pricing. And uh, in my quest to learn about this business model, which we currently run now, I also connected with Service Roundtable and some of the uh, some of the best practices groups which I've been involved with for many years. And in a quest to learn, I decided to start a training organisation, Service Professionals Australia. And a lot of people ask me why would I want to get into the training space? And it was always well, I, I've been wanting to bring the information and the resources, the trainers, all the intellectual property from the US to Australia, and having an organization that could do that uh, was the way to go. So, but Omega's now we're we're at um, yeah we're we're at about the seventy five staff mark. Our business uh, is we haven't been growing as much in the last year as we have previously, but we're still in growth mode and uh, we're still, you know, we're probably our business will probably do somewhere between 17 to 18 million for the financial year. And Service Professionals Australia is where I, I wouldn't say I spend all my time, Matt, Matt, but (laughs) I'm very passionate about the industry and helping the industry. And uh, so Service Professionals Australia is a a training organisation for plumbers, electricians and air conditioning technicians that really want to grow their business. Yeah, fantastic. So um, look, I asked you to tell a bit of that story because I just want your listeners out there to appreciate that Alan certainly does have runs on the board. This is not some guy sitting in an office with a university degree that's telling you this, like Alan's been there and he's done it and he is doing it and he's got a company that does it as well. So uh, the Amiga, Alan's quite modest. Uh, the Amiga Group's probably, I would say, probably the largest plumbing electrical HVAC company uh, it's in Sydney at the moment, or if not one of a couple. So um, listen in, folks. So, um, Al, we've had, um, I, I suppose the questions that, you know, you've been really helpful with it within the group are all related to sales in one way or another. Uh, you just alluded to the fact that you, you know, you are pretty heavily involved within the flat rate realm. I suppose, why don't we just start at the top here? I mean, you sent through a few ideas before and uh, I normally would go through and sort of structure these podcasts, but I figured that those questions or those topics that you sent through, they're all they're all pretty relevant. And I think I think if, if anyone out there wants more information specifically on any of these, uh, look, by all means, all you need to do is just reply or wherever you see this see this podcast, whether it's through social media or if you're on our um on our email list, then you can just reply to the email and ask us what you want to hear more about. And Alan's already said that he's happy to come back and do some follow-ups and dive a little bit deeper into some of this stuff. So the goal of today, um, Alan, is just to give the guys a bit of an overview, I suppose, to some of these topics, and um, then we might strategize a little bit down the track on how we can expand on some of them. What do you reckon? Oh, I'd love to, Matt. Yeah, beautiful. Cool bananas. So why don't we just start at the top here? I mean, the first thing that you, you, know, you sent across was, you know, why do we get into the trades? Is it to learn sales or to fix stuff? <laughs> yeah, look, brilliant question. And and uh, the reason I thought that would be a good way to lead here, and, and I uh, consider myself a trainer of technicians um, and I also work with uh, call center reps, um, business owners, managers and you know as you know I'm partnership with Peter Cox and we have a leadership uh, development uh, company leading for growth but um, it's always the question that I put forward to my team in training and I'm still very active with training my uh, my company 
and uh, my service technicians, I, I, I get tempted to call them sales technicians, but they're not. <laughs> uh, when I ask the question, uh, guys, did you get into this industry to sell or did you get is, into this industry to fix stuff? It's very rarely the uh, they didn't get into the industry to sell. But in our industry and when you're in a, uh, a uh, I suppose, a face-to-face relationship with a customer, you are selling. And, uh, you know, I, I always say that sales is nothing more than showing the customer that you have a solution to their problem for what it is, whatever it is they called you out for. Sales is a dirty word, and I think probably not so from our industry, but probably we all refer to the used car salesman, right? Mm. Um, and, you know, when you mention the word sales, people don't want to be sold to, but everyone wants to buy. And and that word sales is just, it's got a bad, it's got a bad name. And uh, so, like I said, I asked my guys, did you get into the business to sell? No, they got into this, they got into this industry to help serve and, and fix things. Yep. So, what I say to the guys is, well, why don't we stop trying to sell and start trying to solve the problems for the customer? And, you know, a good, good friend of mine who's coming out to visit us soon, and you met Joe Cunningham. Did you meet Joe Cunningham in uh, Vegas, Matt? Uh, yeah, I did. Yeah. Yep. Joe's are probably regarded as one of the best sales trainers uh, in the industry. I was fortunate enough to, uh, in my friendship with Joe, we got to meet a fellow by the name of Tom Hopkins, who is probably regarded as the greatest sales trainer in, in, in the planet, come from the real estate industry. Joe's good friends with Tom. We went to his house. And uh, you now you get to meet some industry greats that are taking sales in a, a completely different light. So Joe Cunningham when he does a training session with a with a room full of techs, he'll, the first thing he'll say is, guys, stop trying to sell and let's start trying to solve problems for the customers. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think that's the basis of our conversation. Flat rate pricing comes up. One of the, um, the questions that got sparked my attention, Matt, was uh, charging for quotes. And uh, and and I, I just want to make sure we cover that one off and the reason I believe you need to charge for quotes at somewhere in this podcast. I don't mind when. Yep. But, uh, well, look, well, I mean, why don't we just segue into that now? So, <clears throat> I mean, we've, we've covered podcasts in the past on, on charging for quotes. However, it's been more, that podcast was sort of more targeted towards say builders and people or, or companies that are doing sort of project based work so you know guys that are basically giving like a detailed breakdown of the project that has to take take part as opposed to i suppose where you come from which is more from a service based um you know, industry so yeah yeah i'm definitely definitely um keen to hear about you know the various ways you can set up flat rate and pricing for service and all this kind of stuff Sure. Well, I am a massive believer that um, as a as a technician, and you know, we're we're plumbers, me and you, we're plumbers, or and and I have electricians, and I have uh, heating and cooling technicians that they want. We want to go out and fix things, right? And uh, but what we don't want to do is if we're driving around Sydney, and and I mean, driving around Sydney is one of the most painful things you can do. <laughs> Uh, root canal therapy, the dentist driving yeah. around Sydney. Look, I'd have to toss a coin on that one, <laughs> but um, it's horrible. And you know, we're our customers, and and look, this is not their fault. They believe that we should be running around doing free quotes, and and I completely disagree with that. I think yeah. it's 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 wrong. And the companies that are saying they're doing free quotes and running around, I mean, their their results will not be as good as a company that decides to charge for a quote. And I've listened to most of your podcasts and uh, and I agree with the builder who will give a fee, let's say it's a thousand dollars or two thousand, because he knows he needs to spend, might need to spend several days on that. And and I think the way to do this is to say, look, this is my fee. I'm I'd rather uh, charge of this fee. And if you go ahead with the job, we'll waive that fee. Yeah. And uh, and I think that running around for free with, with the cost of you know, fuel and the vehicles and insurance and everything is just not right. But we do it a little bit differently. Now, if, if if at Omega, if we were to charge what it actually costs for my guys to sit in traffic for an hour, <laughs> 
go to the customer's home, yeah. uh, spend time diagnosing, our service fee would be hundreds of dollars and our customers are not going to wear that. So we believe in a low service fee and and look, we somewhere around the anywhere from fifty to eighty dollars. And what that does, Matt, is it, it sorts out the price shoppers, the customers that just yep. want to get five free quotes. Yep. So having a low, and we call our, our dispatch fee, it's a loss leader. It's basically, it's just to, it's what it does is it is it uh, it shows that the customer is serious to qualify. and they really want to go ahead. And we have a phenomenally high conversion rate. Yeah, uh, Our conversion rate across the company, and a lot of people are probably, that know our company and know our charges are probably going, no, that can't be right. But we, we're we probably close to 90%. Wow. Um, probably mid, mid-80s to high-80s is our company conversion rate. And I think that's a bit high. Is that, Alan, but, are you talking about converting, say, the, the incoming call to a service charge? Or are you talking about converting a service charge into a job? Service charge into a job. Oh, so wow. now, our, our, see... Conversion over the phone, that's a completely different right. subject. And I would be happy to do some further a further podcast on call conversions yep. because that can be a real that can really do your head in. But uh, <laughs> and, and we, we probably won't have time to go into that. I'm happy to if you want to. But so the conversion rate from having a customer that's let's say they've got a burst hot water system or a drain that's blocked, we give them a fee to go to their home. And uh, our conversion rate from that fee to actually winning the work is uh, is is let's call it eighty five percent, which wow. is quite high for our industry. Yeah, okay. And so I suppose at the end of the day, Al, like if we're going to put this in, you know, black and white, the service charge or that you know charge for the quote is really there as a qualifier for potential customers, and then. I suppose as a way that we can recoup some of the costs that it would typically, you know, you'd typically incur for your time to get out there. I mean, if you like you were saying, if you've got to drive an hour to get somewhere to quote a job and that doesn't come off, I mean, if you do that five times a day, you've made no money. So yeah, it doesn't really make any sense. In our business and our structure and our overhead, it does very little. I would be happy to run the calls for free, but our guy, our guys do not convert as much work. The, right. the customer that balks on, I'm not going to pay a service fee because everyone else is, is not charging a service fee. That's not the customer that we want to uh, to go to. And I know companies, we both know companies that charge, uh, a good friend of mine's company charges about $200 for a service fee, and they have very good success with that. Yeah. And that's probably where we should be, but I probably haven't got the balls to buddy do it. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit, Al, about um, about this whole um, flat rate sort of style model, upfront pricing, whatever you want to call it, quoting. Yeah. Because, you know, there is a bit of, I mean, like I did a complete series on this a little while back. So there's, there's a bit of information which I'll post links to within the show notes, but I'd just like to hear your take on it. I suppose I think a lot of people, you know, with an upfront price, but you need to understand that it's it's there to cover your overheads, right? Like it's not just the price of okay that time and your, and the material. Like you're really there to cover the overheads of your business. Is that right? Well, not only that, yeah, the overheads of your business plus whatever the profit, the net profit that you desire. Right. So, uh, and there's a lot of controversy about what is an ethical net profit now. Uh, <laughs> If a McDonald's can a McDonald's owner can have a 20, 22 percent net profit, why can't a plumber, an electrician, or a HVAC tech? But the industry average is probably closer to three percent net profit. So there is a big problem there. Now, part of the problem that I am and look, I thought the uh, episode, the flat rate episode that you did was very informative. I agreed on some of the uh, some of the comments, not all. Yeah. And uh, it's probably not there was nothing wrong with the podcast, don't get me wrong, and great information, but I've spent a lot more time in this space and I've worked with companies ranging from uh, 1 million in revenue to hundreds of millions a year in revenue. Yeah. And uh, and I spend time with the best in the industry just trying to diagnose, I'm trying to uh, dissect the true uh, flat rate business. And uh, yeah, so there is a lot of myth behind flat rate, a lot of uh, the contractors out there. And and I will compare and I can compare the difference between a flat rate business and, a, and an hourly time and material business. Both businesses, I work with companies that 
um, do very, very good profits from hourly rate, but that hourly rate they charge is the correct hourly rate. And I and I will use several companies in the US as an example. And you know, you know quite a few. We we associate with the same people in the US. Mm-hmm. The correct hourly rate is, uh, in my opinion, uh, closer to two hundred dollars an hour. Mm-hmm. And I and I'll give an example. Anyone that's got uh, that's listening to the podcast, and it's always a good idea, guys, to have a a, a pen and pad with you, take some notes, because a lot of this stuff that you'll get from me and Matt, you can actually go and do a little bit of research yourself and find out that we're uh, we're telling you the truth. Look up a company called Pimlico. It's in the UK. They actually are an hourly company, uh, one of the most successful companies on the planet. Their hourly rate they put up on their website, and it's close to I think from memory, £280 per hour is the rate that they advertise. Now, in Australian dollars, that's probably close to 500 Would that be right, Matt? Don't know where the sterling yeah, is right now. Today. Um, now, that's a company that knows what it needs to charge. It knows what its costs are. It has a, high, it has a, a very high standards, and people are happy to pay that because they're getting a good quality company. I know companies in Sydney that charge a higher average hourly rate to what the market will bear and do very nicely. So yeah. a, a true flat rate company a tr- an, or a true company that knows its costs, knows exactly what the overhead of the company is, they know what their efficiency rates are. See, with an, with a, an, an hourly company, you can charge, you pretty much charge for all the labour that you incur. But with a, a time, a, a, sorry, a flat rate company, Matt, you have to actually know what the efficiencies of your business. And this is where a lot of contractors get it wrong. So with all the successful companies I work with, I've found that the average service company in a city like Sydney or Los Angeles or even Manhattan, New York, runs an efficiency rate between 40% to 50%. So let's I, I like to use 50% as the as a good benchmark. So what that means if you pay your technicians for 40 hours, they should theoretically bill you out. 20 hours. That's 50%. Now, if you're charging 100 bucks an hour, your hourly rate, and you need that 100 bucks an hour to bill 40 hours, what's that rate going to be like if you can only bill out 20 hours? Basically, you've doubled your hourly rate. Mm. This is where a lot of contractors get it wrong. They don't allow for the inefficiencies, and they make up for this by just working longer hours, working weekends. And But uh, I, I suggest that everyone takes a look at what it costs to run their business. You should be able to work 40 hours and make at least 50% to 100% double what you would earn working for someone else. So if you can work for someone else and you can earn 100,000, and I've got many guys in our company earn way above that. If you were to go out and work for yourself and take the risk, and uh, uh, you should be theoretically be able to earn double what you would earn. And and a lot of contractors don't. They go out there and they do earn more, but they they put in massive, massive hours. So, yeah. so basically, the difference between the two is just in how you decide to run your business and charging the correct money. Forget what the marketplace will bear, okay? Trust me. Uh, the market will not bear the charges that you need to run your company. It costs more to run a plumbing electrical company than it does, say, a doctor's practice or a law practice. It costs more. Uh, and anyone that wants to challenge me on that one, I, I'll take that argument with anyone. Yeah, no, I'm sure. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's all well and good for companies that are charging for <clears throat> time and material. But then how does the fixed race pricing I, mean, I suppose I'm going back to a question that was asked in the group here by, you know, Bradford. He, you know, he wanted to know yep. sort of the pros and cons of fixed pricing versus time and material. So we've sort of, you sort of give it as some of the cons there of time and material. How does fixed uh, pricing, I suppose, vary in that regard? Like, how do you address that problem with a fixed price? Okay, so a fixed price is uh, Matt is no different than a builder who has a fixed price on building a single story or a double story home. Right, it's a bet. Right. So let's say if our company, if all it did was service toilets or lavatories, whatever they like to call them. So yeah. now you've got you've got listeners in the US, right? Yeah. Let's say if we were just a, a a lavatory toilet servicing company and we knew that you know m- majority of our work was replacing the inlet valve with a fluid master, whatever, and we know that the last hundred jobs we did took 30 minutes, the average. Some plumbers 
they have trouble, it takes an hour, some do it in 15 minutes. So what you need to do is, is have a time allocation for everything you do. So mm-hmm. if you were, say, let's say this is an example that you could um, replace that valve in 30 minutes on site and you were charging, let's say, a service fee of 60 bucks and labor of 100, say, plus the part. That sounds like about a $200 job that you were charging. So what if, theoretically, you could do, if you could train your guys to do that job in 15 minutes, okay? So you've basically, what you've done, you've, you've basically doubled your earnings and you're giving a fixed price on that. And this is where a lot of contractors actually they, they get scared about fixed pricing. Now, I can tell you horror stories on jobs where we've allowed four hours to do a job, let's say replacing a vanity, and the job goes horribly wrong and it takes two days. Uh, a lot of contractors have fear of the job that goes long. You've got to take the good with the bad here. Um, your goal, in my, in my opinion, and working with a lot, a lot of uh, successful contractors, you should be winning about 70% of the time. So your rates need to be based on your efficiency mm-hmm. and you have to allow a certain time to actually do the job. You should know what the materials are, but you can pretty much flat rate anything when you've got the knowledge, the, the knowledge of how long something will take. It's your labor, how long, the cost of the materials, how much you want to mark that up, and what what labor rate do you really need to charge based on the overhead of running your company? Yeah, I think that's a good point, actually, you know, because I think you're right. A lot of people out there, they'd be sort of thinking, you know, what happens? It's all good if it goes the right way. But what if you go to that, you know, replace that inlet valve and something else goes wrong and you end up spending twice as long there? You sort of done your, have you done your money? But I suppose if you buffer it out across the board, then if you've priced it correctly, ideally, you should be accounting for that. You're always going to have jobs that go south. It doesn't matter what it is. The simplest of jobs go south. I mean, we've played in the reline in space for me. I know you, that's where I first met you. Mm-hmm. You were working for a relining pipe patching company. Well, that's a bet as well. Now, a lot of contractors think when they see that a company can charge, say, $4,000 to put a, a simple patch in a pipe with root intrusion, that's just way over the top. That's too expensive. Well, hang on. Let's just think about that job when it's underneath a, a bathroom, underneath concrete. Not every job goes right. We had one go south on us yesterday, underneath concrete deep. The packet got stuck and we're digging that thing. So yeah. we can't dig that We can't dig concrete down however deep and fix that for four grand. It's on us. And and that happens. So you have to, your pricing has to allow for that. And you have to allow for the job that goes south. But you're not passing that on to every job. You're you're dividing that up. You know, you might have in the relining world, you might have uh, uh, a 90% success rate, meaning 10% of your jobs are going to go, are going to go pear shaped. So that needs to be factored in. But we're all going to have work that goes south. And and I think that does stop a lot of contractors. They're way safer staying on the hourly rate and charging. But what is that fair for the customer? I mean, the customer where we would normally do a vanity replacement in four hours where it takes two days and his bill comes to thousands of dollars. Is that fair? Because no, it's probably not. Yeah. So what about the um, the different pricing structures, Alan? I mean, I know, you know, you've got that whole good, better, best sort of Yep. mantra there. Do you want yep. to talk talk through that with us? Yeah, look, the good, better, best. I, you know, being a disciple of the the Charlie Greers and the Kenny Chapmans and uh, the Joe Cunninghams, with flat rate pricing, uh, it's all about giving the customer options. What I know in, in many years of studying what is actually successful, what I've noticed is that if you were to go to any job and just give the customer a price for what it is they called you out for, your success rate is a lot lower than if you give the customer options. So I always we we always do a courtesy inspection on every job we go to. Now, the reason we do that is because, you know, we'll go around the home and we'll check things out. And if there's any little free adjustments, we can do loose toilet seat, or we might have the button loose on the, on the, on the, the flick mixer or the the faucet or um, yeah. just the little things you can do. But what you're doing is you're compiling a list of recommendations for the customer. Now, the good, better, best is a, is basically, I like to use that when a customer says, I called you out just to fix 
this faucet or this uh, this tap, that's all I want to price for. Well, you want to give the customer multiple options. You want to give them, you know, the top of the range. You'd say, look, you know, for a little bit extra, we can give you the the the, the latest model that that does everything, or we can give you, you know, the, to replace the tap you got now. We'll call that the 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 better option, or yeah. So you've got a okay. You you might name your options uh it, it differently, but good, better, best is giving the customer different options for each of your repairs, mainly so they've got something to say no to. And what I've found is if you follow this good, better, best principle for everything you do, if you go into every every customer's home you go into and you offer them a premium service, statistically, one in 10 will actually go with the absolute top of the range option. That's fact. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then so the goal there, I suppose, is to, I mean, realistically, would most people be trying to choose the middle one or is that normally how it looks? I don't want the cheapest. I don't want the most expensive. Give me the one in the middle. Yeah, look, every customer is different. I think uh, statistically about 15% of our of, of people that we're in front of buy on price alone. So right. that means that the other 85% buy on value. They're buying on value. So it all depends on whether you've matched the product to that person or not. And the yeah, more gotcha. time you can, I talk, I've, I've done a considerable amount of training over the years talking about how to build trust in a, and, and the hardest sale to make, whether you're an hourly company or a, or a flat rate company, the hardest sale to make is usually with a customer that you haven't got a relationship with. Of course. I believe we're in the relationship relationship economy and uh, a relationship has to be established. It's a fact you will only sell to that customer the value of to a value of the level of trust that that customer's instilled in you. Yeah, and look, this is a <clears throat> this is a big thing and something that we see a lot of. Actually, it's something that I'll be presenting at the um at the Service Success Academy, which you're holding, which we'll get to in a little bit. But I um, mean, that's yeah. a, a big thing for the listeners out there. You know, there's so I think what people fail to realise is you're eight times more likely to retain a client than you are to gain a new one, which has compounding effects all over the place. In the sense that you know you could be spending all this money on on, on marketing, whereas if you just applied a bit of that energy towards looking after the customers that are technically already qualified, like anyone that's already bought off you, it's going to be a lot easier for you to get your foot back in the door of that house than it is to somebody that has, you have no relationship with. And I think guys just really drop the ball on maintaining those relationships with, with those people, which ends up costing them a lot. So I would certainly agree with that comment. I think it's good that you brought that up. Building trust is the is – the, uh, it's, it's the – it's what's going to help you improve your salesmanship is having and it's it's not just about what you say and do with a customer it's also as charlie greer says it's the num it's the amount of time you spend with that customer and i like to in any situation where i'm in front of a customer i like to present myself to the customer let me go and do my thing then i'll i'll come and get you um you know if i find something and charlie says you've got to have like three three or four meetings with the customer. Now that can be all in the one visit, but you've got to they've got to get to know you and got to get to trust you because you're not going to sell anything or you're not going to be able to go ahead with anything unless you are able to have that relationship. Definitely one hundred percent. When my technicians get in front of a customer that they've already done work for before and they know our business model, they know how we operate there their success rate is way higher. My guys still have good success rate with new customers, but not quite as good as when they've already got a relationship with uh, with the yep. customer. That was the first part of the conversation that I recorded with Alan from Service Professionals Australia. Stay tuned. That was um, It was one conversation and I cut it in half because it went a little bit longer than it normally does. Um, however, in the second part of this conversation, we're talking a little bit more about proposal follow-up. Uh, which has been a bit of a hot topic within our Facebook community. So stay tuned for that. And if you enjoyed the show, please go ahead and leave us an iTunes review or Stitcher or wherever you consume your delightful podcasting media. And of course, uh, make sure you head across to the Facebook community where you can join the conversations. Ciao. Thank you for listening to another episode of Toolbox Talks. If you're liking what you hear, then you can head across to the siteshed.com where you can join our community by signing up to our Toolbox Talks. Uh, You'll get sent a weekly 
notification, which is basically a highlight of everything that we've spoken about during that week, along with any other industry news that may be relevant or specific to the trades. If you're enjoying the show, you can head across to iTunes, Stitcher, or SoundCloud, where you can leave us a review. Uh, That would be fantastic, and all the reviews get read out in the show. Uh, Likewise, if you have any friends or colleagues that you think would benefit from the show and the, the episodes that we create, then please go ahead and share it with them.